I'm Dapper Dan Gavazdan, and I own every issue of Amazing Spider-Man, including the annuals, which definitely count. Thank you for joining us for this special Amazing Friends episode of The Amazing Spider-Talk, the show where two fans and collectors uncover the strange, fun, and fascinating history of the Spider-Man comic universe. If you want to swing along with us on our journey through Spidey's past, present, and future, subscribe to Amazing Spider Talk on your favorite podcast app. Every other week, we put out a mainline episode of our flagship show, and sprinkled in between, we review new comics, as well as interview some of the greatest Spider-Man creators of yesterday and today. This, as always, is the perfect time to start listening. But today, I've got a special treat for you. By strange circumstances, I found myself lucky enough to sit down for a long conversation with another amazing friend, none other than artist Rick Leonardi. Rick Leonardi has worked in the comics industry for four decades, with credits spanning Marvel and DC's catalog. Cloak and Dagger, The Uncanny X-Men, The New Mutants, Nightwing, Batgirl, Green Lantern, Superman, and Star Wars. He's done it all. But for our purposes, Rick Leonardi is most famous for co-creating Miguel O'Hara, the Spider-Man of the year 2099, alongside writer Peter David. His run on the title would last for 25 issues, including a separate adventure where Spider-Man 2099 meets Spider-Man, a great issue. He's also worked on a number of amazing Spider-Man issues, including issue number 253, where he and Tom DeFalco co-created The Villainous Rose. It's quite the biography, but enough with the pleasantries. Let's get to my interview with artist Rick Leonardi. Well, welcome to the Amazing Spider Talk, Rick. We're really excited to have you as as fans of Spider-Man 2099 and all of your work. uh, Thank you again for, for coming on the show. Well, it's my pleasure. My well, you, you know, Rick, uh, we are a Spider-Man focused show, so we're going to only, you know, take so many different glances around your body of work. But I was curious, you know, as a young person, you got started with Marvel pretty early. I mean, like kind of right out of college, if I'm correct. Um, uh, more or less literally. Yeah. I uh, yeah. graduated in, in uh, 1979, June of 79. I was hired January of 80. So... I spent I spent that summer and fall essentially putting together a, a, a submission, a, a job kind of performance thing. So I wrote a I wrote a story. I had three parts. Um, one part actually was a Spider-Man story, and I drew it up. And then I inked it and I put in all the word balloons. And then I took it. This is before Kinkos. I took it to the local printer, and they were on massive oversized bristle boards and um, had them shrunk down at great expense using the photomechanical transfer process um, to official comic book size. So eight and a half by 11, shipped those off respectively to DC and Marvel and waited and nothing happened. And eventually I heard back from, um, from Jim Shooter, Actually, to shorten the story, I, I went down and actually tried to, I had to rescue my submission. I was, I had to go recover them. Even if I wasn't going to get an answer, I needed my art back was my attitude. <laughs> so I stormed into the office and he said, oh, you, well, hmm, we, uh, we're not sure what kind of penciler you would make, but we think your writing's interesting. So uh, your submission has been sitting on Archie Goodwin's desk this long while. And Archie Goodwin being less organized than Jim Shooter, the, the submission that sort of gotten lost amidst his papers. So that was the explanation for why they hadn't replied. Um, and also the, the explanation for why they f- couldn't really evaluate me as a penciler. The, the pencils were all hidden over by ink or covered by balloons or too small to read. Hmm. So Shooter made the, the, the completely rational, reasonable request that I go back and do three more pages of just pencils on ordinary sketch paper with an ordinary pencil and bring those back. Um, and in the subsequent meeting later that month in January of 1980, he hired me. It's like a, a case of you doing too much and confusing people or something like that. Um, yeah, a case of a case of 
uh, not really, uh, not really evaluating in a, in a clear eyed fashion, what job I want to do, I guess. <laughs> Think about it as a sort of a dumb mistake to make, but I made it. So, well, it, I mean, it just sounds like someone who had a, like a, a fervor for what he wanted to do. Um, I, I am curious though, you know, getting into it. I mean, I, 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 even though, you know, you, maybe you messed up and you needed to resubmit, you still got in pretty quickly and cleanly. Um, you know, growing up was, you know, were comics and Marvel a big part of your life? Um, was, was it something that you regularly engaged with or something you came to later on? Um, no, I think the, the first, I like, to, I like to say that the first comic book I ever saw was Star Spangled War Stories, I think 173, something like that. It was an enemy A story. And um, so... Uh, you know, I was I was a Joe Kubert fan right out of the box, um, and that was that was third grade, maybe something like that. So that was a long time ago. What does a third grader recognize in Joe Kubert's art that draws him in? Is it like layouts? Like your mind can read that even that young? Or yeah, I I think it was just the 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 desperation of the of the situation that he was in. I, I remember likewise uh, about the same era reading back when Doctor Strange and Nick Fury had they shared an issue that like you know part one part two kind kind of thing. Um, I remember the doc, I, the Nick Fury story was, had Nick Fury was in the clutches of Yellow Claw, and his situation was pretty dire. And I remember thinking that that was pretty grim. I didn't realize it at the time, but I think I was looking at Jim Steranko pencils, or if not Jim Steranko, then at least Kirby, which is pretty amazing. But the the Doctor Strange story um, was the story where. Doctor Strange duels with Dormammu on the with the pincers of power, and I remember reading that and thinking, "Oh, this is this is bad, looking bad for this strange guy." And then Baron Mordo, just when Doctor Strange has Dormammu down, Dorm, uh, Baron Mordo s shoots him in the back with a magic spell and puts him right out. And I was I was horrified. As a kid, that made a big, big impression. So, it was it was the drama of the writing, the predicaments, I think, that really kind of seized me at first, and I later got into the art. You said you included a Spider-Man story in your submissions. Um, like, what was your first experience with the character of Spider-Man? Um, fifth grade, we moved to a town, and the guys across the street were big collectors. And I remember this was just about the time when um, Spider-Man was, I think it was the John Romita senior era. So Fred Foswell, the big man, the kingpin, uh, the issue where Spidey and J. Jonah Jameson are trapped in the water-filled tank. <laughs> yeah, it's a classic. Yeah, it's cla amazing, amazing stuff. But that's, that's what I sort of first came in, when I first came into contact with Spider-Man. Those were the stories. And I worked backwards from that to the, the Ditko stuff. And I stuck with Spider-Man pretty, pretty reliably right up through um, the moment where Jerry Conway killed Gwen Stacy. And that was it for me. Was, uh, <laughs> you were one of those letter writers that complained about it? No, I just I just suffered in silence and, and stopped reading. So that was that. Oh, wow. But, uh, have you told Jerry Conway this? <laughs> I gather he gets it from a lot of various people. I think I, I think this is a this is a, a a theme in his in his life is is explaining away or living down or or haughtily riding by the the, the the throngs of people who are still upset with him about killing Gwen Stacy. But <laughs> Who'd have thought whatever. this, this that's, many that's, years that's, later it would still be a thing? Um, so, so, you know, your first, yeah, it, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. No, I, th I think it's, it's, it would be an interesting topic one day to, to, to discuss writers who, writers who become characters in the stories that they're writing. 
you know, who become sort of the, the, the man behind the curtain. Um, yes, you've picked up an issue of Spider-Man, or yes, you picked up an issue of Fantastic Four. But really what you want to find out is what has John Byrne done to them this month? Or you know, <laughs> what is that kind of thing. So, um, so you know, you, you talked about your portfolio and getting in uh, at Marvel. And the first work that I could find that you did was an issue of Thor. Is that accurate? That's your, fir your first work? Tell me a little bit about... Um, you know how that assignment was given to you, and um, maybe what you what you remember of of it looking back. Well, uh, we re rewind the clock to that January in 1980. Um, to hear Al Milgram tell the story, uh, Shooter, when he saw those the, the pencil stuff that I, that I eventually turned in, Shooter uh, drew him aside, Al Milgram aside, and said, you know, don't let the don't let that kid leave without a, without a story, without a plot. I don't remember that part, but um, the fact is there was a, uh, a Thor story lying around uh, in a drawer, an inventory story is what they used to call them, um, by Doug Munch, right? I think, yes. I think so, yes. Um, Thor, it was Thor 303. And um, it was a standalone story. It, it sort of, poke gently at the whole question of you know, what a what a man of the cloth what a what a priest would make of the god of thunder if the two of them actually had a, an encounter in more or less you know more or less stressful situations which in this case was the the priest's church burning down thor came to the rescue so um it was an adventure and you know <laughs> ecumenicism is what it was but um, it was an interesting story. And like I say, it, 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 it was looking for a home and Shooter sent me away with it. And he, um, his instructions were, to me were, I was living in New Hampshire at the time. He said, you must, all right, the one thing you have to do is you have to come down, find a place um, handy enough to New York so you can come down um, into the office at least three or four times a week. So we could evaluate your two, what you've what you've done, you know, over the over the last 24, 36 hours of work. Um, so he was, in other words, he was going to be supervising almost panel by panel the, the 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 production of that issue. So I got a rented room in Montclair, New Jersey. I came over on the path train, just like that, three, three, four times a week. And um sat on his knee basically and, and listened to him, you know, discuss why this panel worked and why that panel didn't and all that kind of stuff. And I did a lot of revisions, but that was, that was how Thor 303 was done. The next one I was able to take back to Massachusetts to my parents' house where, you know, I, I had all my stuff was stashed still. So I did that one there, and but once again was in phone contact with Shooter three, four times a week. Same deal. Uh, I mean, that's fascinating. How much attention to detail? I mean, because I can't imagine that one person could do this for every person on the staff. <laughs> Although Jim, stories about Jim Shooter are legendary. Um, you know, did did you find this? What, was this a case of him wanting to kind of mentor you? Like, it, what what is your takeaway from well, that level of, of attention? I think, you know, this gets at the whole issue of shooter shooter the, the, the monumental figure. But I think if you if you strip away um, a lot of the, you know, a lot of the, the 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 he said she said and the and and the politics of it at heart, Shooter was just a stickler for the mechanics of storytelling. He really wanted the stories to be as clear as possible, and, and his sympathies, I think, throughout really lay with um, the poor benighted reader who was picking up a comic book without the benefit of the plot and the the writer you know, the writer's inspiration who had to make his way through the story just based on the pictures and, and the text. And his, I think his feeling was that the, the, that there was a right way to, to do that and a wrong way to do that. And was, or maybe, maybe there was a rigorous way to do it and there was a lazy way to do it. It's a better way to, to put it. 
And um, that much he was going to insist on, at least for his fledgling pencilers. His thing was, you know, you had to you had to know the rules before you could break them. And the, his his classic exception to the rule, of course, is Frank Miller, who he always pointed to as a guy who, yes, yes, big innovator, and gets all kinds of press for being, you know, cutting edge and pushing the envelope and all that kind of stuff. But when he was when he was first hired up, you know, he 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 towed the line and did any number of of fill-ins for Shooter that 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 pretty much held to standard recognizable rules of storytelling. Very cool. So, um, you know, you kind of had a variety of projects and, you know, for, for our purposes, one of the bigger contributions that you had earlier on in your career at Marvel um, is kind of like regarding the design process for Spider-Man's black costume. And, you know, there's been, you know, a lot of back and forth of, who did what? So um, I'm I'm going to tell you what my understanding of it, and it and it is, and if I'm wrong, correct me. Okay. Um, right. So my understanding is that Mike Zeck did the original design for the suit, like a, a sketch, um, and Marvel then asked him for a turnaround model sheet, but because of his delayed work on Secret Wars, he was unable to uh, accommodate that. So then they came to you to do a model sheet. Uh, where you embellished on his original sketches um, and kind of were labeled as the designer of the costume once your model sheet was published in Marvel Age magazine. Um, I believe even I, I was looking at the magazine today and there were notes that credited you with kind of creating the organic webbing that comes out of the back of the hand. Um, what, what do I have right or wrong about that? I, th um, I think that is, I think that's substantially correct. The only part that I hadn't heard till, till th that retelling is, is that, uh, that Mike Zeck was approached first to do the, the three view, but couldn't on account of time. I mean, uh, that might just, that might just be speculation <laughs> on, on my yeah. part. Uh, yeah. um, so, so they, yeah. so in your understanding, they came to you first. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, no, no, they came, they came to the, the sketch was, was Mike's and yeah. shooter shooter waved it at me and said, look, here's, here's this character. Can you do work up a three view, tweak this a little bit? I don't know whether he used the word tweak or what, or just how big my, my, my remit to fool with the design actually was. But um, all I really did was I put an extra joint in the legs and I separated the legs instead of being a kind of a, a, a broad white band with essentially lightning zigzags on them. I put actual discrete for, I made, in other words, I made the character a lot harder to draw. So. <laughs> well, I've seen uh, your, your, your model sheet and I, you even wrote on there, you know, let's make these legs distinct or, or forget your exact phrasing on that, but more, yeah, more like, more like actual spider legs, basically. Yeah. I mean, it looked like, to me, it looked like Charlie Brown's sweater. That was my fear. It looked a bit too much like. Yeah, I guess that wouldn't be a positive. Thing. Yeah, no, um, no. You know, a lot, a lot of these, um, and I don't want to go down the the whole rabbit hole here of this, but I am curious. You know, a, a lot of these creations of characters or suits or whatever are often very, con you know, like conflicted or complicated. You know, whether it's the Stan and Jack thing, uh, you know, who's behind what. Um, like, what are your feelings about? Um, you know, credit in terms of design, you know, uh, maybe just take this for an, an example. Like, do you consider yourself like a co-creator of that outfit or is it you're merely, you tweaked it and Zach deserves all the credit? Yeah, no, I think, I think Zach deserves all the credit. And I just, I just, well, you know, it's even more complicated than that. I mean, we, right. we, have, we have to get into the whole, the whole Randy Schneider story. Well, there's that too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, but, uh, in other words, I mean, these things, these things arise organically. Everybody has a little bit of input. Um, I mean, a guy like Jack, I, I, I mean, Jack is one of those guys who you can point to him and said, yes, he created that character because he did, you know, he yeah. just went away, came back with it. And there it was. Um, I don't think I've ever really been in that position. I mean, Spider-Man 2099's costume gets a lot of accolades. But it's, you know, first of all, it's derivative of the black costume, which in itself is, you know, comes from, has its own sort of 
lineage. Um, and as Marvel took, you know, Marvel pointed out to me and took pains to point out to me that uh, Spider-Man was a, you know, a wholly owned character up there. And yes, it's Spider-Man 2099, but it's still Spider-Man. So <laughs> here's your, here's your kill fee. Go away. Don't expect any more royalties. Oh no. So, um, so, so moving on to the, to 2099, we'll use that as a bridge to discuss 2099. Um, you know, the 2099 line was originally announced as the Marvel world of tomorrow as developed by Stan Lee and John Byrne, which later changed to Marvel 2093. And then wow. ob obviously Marvel 2099. I, I, I'm curious at what point in the development process of this universe were you brought in? Oh, if that if that was the process, then I have to say relatively late. Um, uh, I was I was brought in shortly before the the the, the offsite meeting, the meeting in the hotel room, where all the creative teams got together and we were supposed to hash out the Bible and figure out what the what the world of Nueva York in 2099 was really going to be all about. Um, but by then, it was pretty much all. The, the teams were established, the characters were established and named. Um, a lot of the technology had already more or less been settled on. Hmm, interesting question. I mean, the backstory there is interesting as well in that, notwithstanding um, the success of the Days of Future Past arcs that Chris Claremont wrote for the X-Men, stories uh marvel was very skittish then just then about uh, any story set in the future uh any kind yeah. of you know speculative what if kind of stuff that involved their characters in future scenarios for the very obvious reason that if you saw if you were reading the adventures of a character who was who was identified as peter parker's grandson um you weren't going to be that worried about Peter Parker's adventures in the present. You know, you wouldn't, be, if Peter Parker was hanging over a vat of acid, thanks to the green goblin today, <laughs> you weren't going to be worried about it because he hadn't gotten married yet and hadn't had kids. And you knew he was going to do that because look over there. Right. So, um, yeah, uh, that was their concern. Um, they're, they're, this is, this is the era of the, of the Terminator and all that kind of stuff can recursive time loops and changing the past and all this sort of stuff. And I, I, I think as Tom DeFalco explained it to me, Marvel really wasn't going to go there. They did. They institutionally, they just weren't going to mess with that stuff. Uh, at least that was the, I think that was the reasoning behind, for example, at about the same time, Anno Senti was trying to pitch something um, a dystopic future kind of thing, and she was getting nowhere with it. I actually did some some uh, exploratory pages with that 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 never got published. Um, but that was the reason why you know her her pilot programs weren't getting off the ground. And then along comes Spider Man twenty ninety nine, and I was kind of surprised as a result because I knew that backstory. Um, the firewall, if you will, if you if you if you read through, uh, there's, there's kind of a, a thread in all the stories where the Marvel of the past. First of all, none of the none of the characters in 2099 are in any sense blood descendants of right. characters of the present, and um, moreover, the the superheroic present is to the world of 2099 hazy legend, barely remembered. You know that kind of yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I, I I think from Marvel's from the company's point of view, that was enough distance and enough kind of you know enough of an arm's length that they were they were comfortable with the experiment at least for a while. And yet, time marches on, and sooner or later, it will be twenty ninety nine. Yeah, <laughs> and we'll have to reckon with this. <laughs> um, although oh, it has well. it has been turned into a multiverse. Uh, by now and not the actual future. I, I, if, if I'm correct, I don't, I can't ever keep up with it. It's always changing. Um, 
but you know, I guess that gets to the point, you know, today the multiverse is all the rage. Um, and you know, in 1992, this idea of like you were saying, alternate Marvel future or alternate Mar Marvel universe is still in its infancy. Um, you know, with all the various titles, you know, how did everybody create this kind of cohesive universe? You said there was a Bible. Was there a design document of all the different factions and, and visual references um, that you were to work with? And, and, and yeah, to that point, I, what was your role in defining that? Well, I think, um, I, I think there must've been, there must've been somebody in charge. I, I suspect Joey Cavalieri you know, had a pretty fixed idea of what was in and what was out as far as, um, the broadly science fiction aspects of it. Uh, I was surprised. I was surprised, for example, I mean, we, we, we went to great lengths to establish that, uh, at least as far as Spider Man 2099 was concerned, Nueva York ran on uh, maglev. They had a maglev roadway, they had these little cars that right. know, zip, zip just off the pavement. And the police cruisers um, and everything. Yeah, and all that kind of stuff. They they had fully airborne stuff, but they also had roadable. Those were roadable. Also, there were vehicles that that uh, that never got more than a couple, you know, inches off the maglev strips and all that kind of stuff. But crucially, no anti gravity. That was the thing. No anti gravity. We're gonna have maglev. Or we're gonna have you know. We're gonna have traditional aerodynamics. But that's it. Um, so you can imagine our surprise when we, we opened up pun an issue of Punisher 2099 and they were using the anti-gravity thing for a carnival ride. Um, so, well, you know how it is. Carnivals are always on the cutting edge. Exactly. It's like, you know, pay your, pay your two bucks and go flying off with it. Your anti-gravity belt. It's like, what? You can't do that. <laughs> So, so it's, it sounds a little bit like raucous. Do you, do you feel like as time went on, that kind of vision sharpened itself to that everybody knew what Nueva New York was like and how it functioned? Um, yeah, I, I, I think so. Um, what I, what I like to dwell on my, you asked about my contribution and what I, what I like to look at, uh, what I would point to is the relationship between New York and those maglev roadways and those super tall skyscrapers yeah. all packed tightly together, built on the foundation of the old city below, um, and the updrafts, the, the huge updrafts that would be that would be created by you know that kind of heated structure, basically this tall densely packed vertical structure with a essentially a heating grid at the bottom of it. Um, and that's really, you know, I looked at that and I said, okay, well, our Spider-Man, he's not going to be a flying character, but he can be a gliding character, which again, ties back, tie, it ties very tightly to the, as I say, the architecture and the technology of New York, at least as far as I was seeing it. Um, also ties very, very well to what actual spiders in the wild do. Right. Uh, anyone who's read Charlotte's Web will recognize the, you know, spider spinning a web and gliding away on the breeze. Um, so that's, you know, if I had a contribution to make, it was that. It was, it was sort of uniting as best I could the features of the costume and the way the character used the costume to the environment that he was in um and if the costume works it's probably because it works in that environment you know that that kind of like really distinct visual of all the buildings compacted together this kind of like mega city you know almost judge dread kind of thing um yeah. what were some of the inspirations for the the various visual elements were you a big sci-fi kid growing up were you reading asimov and stuff or we're oh, watching sure. movies, Metropolis. Oh, yeah. yeah, no, read all that, devoured all that stuff. Blade Runner, of course, um, happened along right, had happened along right about that time. I can't remember when Blade Runner originally came out, but it made a huge impression. The mid late eighties. Yeah. So, you know, if you wanted, if you wanted a, if you wanted a future city, you pretty much were doing 
you know, Ridley Scott there for a long while, but yeah, rain's hard. We, 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 <laughs> we bright, we brightened up the weather at least we did that. We, we had John Romita Jr. on the show and he was saying how much he likes rain because you can hide all his mistakes. Wow. Well, well, you gotta have, you gotta have a tame anchor though. You gotta have a, you know, an anchor who's eating out of your hand. That's true. That's true. <laughs> so. Um, so that Spider-Man 2099 costume is, is really unique amongst alternate Spider-Man costumes. I know that you liken it to uh, the black suit, but even then I think it really stands apart from, from the others en enough that it's really sustained quite a legacy for itself. Um, can you speak to the design process for the costume? Like how did you make it look like Spider-Man, but not just be a copy of a re real reorientation of Ditko's designs. And, and did you do research uh, to put it together? Cause I know it, it has kind of like cultural connections associated well, with it. Well, yeah, uh, it, it's kind of, it's, it comes from a shopping list really. Um, and back to that, back to that secret meeting in the hotel room in, in Manhattan. Uh, the conference was, was underway and people were, people were murmuring in, in, their, in their various corners about their various characters. And one thing that Peter, you know, I was sitting there with my sketch pad, a uh, blank piece of paper basically. And Peter said, okay, so we're gonna do Spider-Man 2099. I want the guy, I want the guy to be able to climb walls like the traditional Spider-Man, but um, not by way of any kind of you know secreted adhesive. I don't want to do that stuff. No sticky stuff. So I said, "Well, okay, that doesn't that 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 narrows it down. Doesn't leave us a lot of options." <laughs> um, so I was I was you know I I'd, I'd done some ice climbing way back when I was a kid. So I thought about the those little reverse angled picks that ice climbers use. So I thought, well, you know, get those small enough, but sharp enough and, you know, pointed back along the axis of the finger, there you go. So the first drawing I did was of a hand with tiny little barbs coming out of the fingertips, pointing back towards the palm. And so after that, it was a way we went. The next thing that Peter wanted wanted was uh if you remember the story the costume was was a leftover was a was an actual costume costume that that miguel o'hara had had bought and used during a, a celebration i guess down in mexico of the of the, the dia de los muertos right the day of the dead so he had this thing hanging in the back of his closet from some 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 tourist junket down that way and um, the Dia de los Muertos, for those who don't know, uh, the big theme there is a skull. There's always a skull. A skulls always involved. Skull-shaped candies, skull-shaped everything, basically. Um, and uh, so naturally, we had to put a skull, or at least a facsimile of a skull, somewhere on the right. costume. Um, but it's a spider, so you had to work in. You had to figure out how to do eight legs of some sort, you know, uh, uh, and it worked that in. So an eight-legged skull, that's, e that's, pretty, that's pretty intuitive, just figuring out where to put the legs is the hard part. Um, working the stripe down the arm, I think that was, that was something, I, I think I'd done that before in some other costume somewhere, I forget. Uh, breaking up the silhouette with a couple of fins on the forearms, just so it's not a total, you know, bodysuit. Mm -hmm. That's uh, and it's also a nod to Batman. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, so that's that's pretty easy. The hard part really was the inversion of the face mask. Um, you know, I wanted I wanted a nod to the, to present day Spider Man, obviously Amazing Spider Man, but at the same time I didn't want to rip him off. So why not invert it? is my thought and work in again that, that sort of eight-legged motif which was probably overkill because it is hard to draw but you know that's that's and that's that's where you got that from in terms of it was, the colors, it was an organic process a step-by-step -step process and that's what that's how you wind up with it in terms of the colors are you on team black or team blue um 
Uh, I'm I'm on Team Superman's hair. I mean, what color is Superman's hair? <laughs> I think it's, it's I think it's, it's comic, I think it's, it's black. comic book black. It's comic book black. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, the, good. You know, because like it, we've seen a lot of like interpretations of the character where it's ostensibly blue, you know? Um, yeah. So, you know, but, but, you know, I, I think if you read it, it's supposed to be black. Uh, well, it probably is. It probably is black and probably ought to be black. But one thing I discovered working on the, the original black costume is at least the way I work, I work, I'm a line guy. So I draw, you know, I draw everything out and contour and just line tip of the pencil all the way. And then I go back in and fill in basically. Um, but if you do that, a strange thing happens with characters that are wholly black, wholly silhouetted, their proportions change. What looks right as a drawn shape, a drawn human being, um, in line gets all wonky if you fill it in totally in black. Is that because of the overlapping uh, features or? No, well, the uh, overlapping features would be a help. I think the, the, the closer you get to a total silhouette, the weirder the proportions get, seems to me, at least to my eye. So um, that was one thing I discovered uh, back when we were working on the, the original issues of, of Amazing Spider-Man where the black costume first appeared. Um, that was a period where all the characters were getting really stretched and attenuated anyway. But I was finding that once I blacked the character in on the, the pencil page, the attenuation was really, really uncomfortable. This was really tall, skinny character that I didn't intend at all. So, so yeah. Uh, we'll we'll leave we'll, we'll we'll call it a black costume, but we'll leave the shapes as open as possible, you know. So you can see some muscles and and avoid that that weird that weird effect. And and allow and allow people to misunderstand it to be blue. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and give and give rise to it to a to a lively discussion through the ages. Why not? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you and Peter David worked together on it for, you know, over 25 stories. You know, what was that collaborative process like? It sounds like in terms of the suit, he had a lot of ideas in mind for you to go with, you know, was that, it was it kind of an improvisation together or did Peter come with very like fixed things that he was looking for? Well, you know, he had the, he had the, the he didn't want Spider-Man to stick to anything. And he wanted, um, and he wanted the the Dia de los Muertos thing, and those two. You know, I checked those two boxes. I said, okay, we can do that. And then the rest was, you know, basically as I described. What about so, for the stories? Were you guys? Was he working off full script on on those issues? Or is it, yeah, you know? uh, not full, not you know, Marvel style, right? Not full script to sort of this is. Panel one, this happens. Panel two, this happens. He would occasionally indicate, you know, close up, you know, far away, that kind of thing. Um, but camera, as you can probably surmise from looking at you know, looking at his body of work, he's not um, he's not a big director in the classic sense of it being it being interested in or dwelling on uh, stagecraft, you know, the movements of left and right and up and down and upstage and backstage, not really interested in camera placements. Um, you know, that kind, of, that kind of stuff is not really where he lives. Where he lives is the dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the, 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 the plots that you get from Peter tend to be real dialogue heavy. Um, and as long as you, you've left room for that, you're pretty much good to go. As long as you tell the story, you know, more or less efficiently and leave room for him to dilate uh, textually, uh, he's a happy boy. And that's got to uh, feel good as an, as an artist, right? Because you can kind of go wild with it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's that's actually my preferred way of working, frankly, is, is uh, you know, let that let the let the writer voice the story, let him provide the sound 
and I'll do the pictures. Uh, that seems to me that seems to be a pretty organic breakdown of, of, of a pretty organic division of labor. And I like that a lot. Sorry to interrupt my interview with Rick Leonardi, but I wanted to remind you about the amazing Spider Slack. Hundreds of listeners like you hang out in our community of Spider-Man fans on the Slack. The amazing Spider Slack community is absolutely free to join, and you can jump into active conversations with awesome people about collecting, conventions, movies, new comics, old comics, and more. I'm there all the time. Just this week, we've been discussing our thoughts on the Black Widow movie. So if you want to join this awesome Spider-Man community, just follow the link in the description and be sure to say hi. And once you're there, be sure to let us know what you think of this episode. All right, back to my interview with Rick Leonardi. Um, you know, o- over the years, you've done a handful of amazing Spider-Man issues in what seems to be kind of a fill-in capacity. It, it, you know, uh, is that kind of what what that was and how did some of these jobs arise and then secondarily weirdly so many of them featured jack-o'-lantern is that just coincidence it's, or it's true now it it really is a pretty mixed bag i mean i, I did you know uh, i think the first one out of the gate was uh murder by spiders uh yeah it was death by spiders you're right you're right you're right um dave simons was was the the anchor and the, the only thing I remember about that was I think Tom DeFalco was the editor. And, you know, Tom DeFalco, was, we didn't know each other at that point. And um, our first couple of conversations were, were of, of the usual, hurry up, <laughs> what's taking so long kind of thing. <laughs> and then I, then I, and I actually finally did submit some pages. And his next conversation with me was like, you take your time. You go as slow as you want. <laughs> So, um, which was probably not a great message to send to me because, you know, I'm slow anyway. And that was kind but of, yeah, boring. that was, that was fun. And then, then we moved on to, uh, the next issue, the next Spider-Man issue was, was Bill Mantlo, I believe was a, was a gun control issue. Uh, that was spectacular Spider-Man. Yeah. I don't think anybody wanted to touch that one. <laughs> and then, and then I did, uh, then I got a, the, the, the Jack Lantern issue with, Silver Sable. It's probably not not in order, but the, the the distinguishing feature of that story was that Spider-Man never appeared in it. He was he was completely yeah. absent from the story. Um, it's not a bad little story, and, and and it was my one story to be inked by Vince Coletta. So I actually have a Vince Coletta credit. Hey, the there you go. Oh, very cool. Very cool. Let me, yeah, it is let a, me, it's a real mixed bag. Let me ask you about that. Uh, the story with this gun, IV kill, uh, mm-hmm. spe- spectacular Spider-Man number 71. Um, you said no, nobody wanted to touch it. So is this, you know, th- this was very much like an advocacy and, and or an issues issue. Uh, right. was, this, was this a story that, uh, you know, like was arranged by happenstance for you, or is this something that you, like saw and had an, a particular attachment to like, uh, you know, I want to help make this statement. Mm, uh, no, I think, I think this was just, uh, this was just sort of given to me. There, there, there may have been some thinking that by that point, by that point I was, had proven that I could do, or was at least willing to do <laughs> backgrounds and and uh setting stuff so to the extent that i was i was willing to do the scut work of actually drawing buildings and shadows and trash in the streets and all that kind of stuff and you know maybe maybe they thought well this is the guy for that job (laughs) um get the guy that does the tall buildings but yeah but exactly but the story you know the 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 story was uh, a marker in a way of um, a first introduction to Bill Mantlo and his personal focus. I mean, he was, he was a very issues driven guy. I mean, there's, there's two sides to him. There's the ROM space night stuff that everyone knows. And, um, uh, and, and that's, you know, that paid his bills and, and there's nothing particularly wrong with all that writing, but at the same time, this was a guy who was, you know, who was very 
very into the issues of the day, uh, consumed the news, was putting himself through law school at night so he could be a public defender. Wow. Um, yeah, I mean, this is a guy, this is a guy with a real, you know, this is a social justice warrior before there were such things. And, um, you know, uh, he, he, he swung to the fences with that issue. I think if you look at the structure of the issue, there were, it's, it's told in a vignette sort of style. And each vignette, there is a, there is an inset panel. I forget what the, the, what the precise role of the inset panel actually was, but I think the inset panel was the moment where the gun goes off or the, 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 the wound is inflicted or the, the, the shot is endured. Um, and I, a good few of those actually had to be cut out with a razor blade finally and redone because I, do them, I drew them the way that Bill wanted them. Mm. And that was too much for Marvel. So a lot of those were, were kind of, like I say, they were excised with a knife, flipped over and then redone on the backs. I'm trying to remember if this is like before or after the whole IRA controversy with Marvel uh, and the office is being evacuated. I, I could see them flinching yeah. a little bit about getting too controversial within the pages of their comics. Well, 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 they were ahead of their time. Let's put it that way. Yeah. So, um, you know, so doing these specta few spectacular issues and amazing issues, was it ever your intention to get on one of the Peter Parker Spider-Man titles for a sustained run? Was that something you really wanted in your career? Um, Cause you know, you've been defined uh, like a lot by this 2099 character, um, but you have done this other work. Yeah. I, uh, getting onto a book was never really a thing with me. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, I think I got, you know, I got, I got that vision Scarlet Witch thing dropped on me fairly early and that kept me busy for a good long while to the, to the 82, 83 period. And before you knew it, Cloak and Dagger popped up and, um, you know, that again, kept me pretty busy right up to, I don't know, through 1984-5, I want to say. And then um, when I wore up my welcome with Cloak and Dagger, uh, <laughs> the, the phone rang the next day and it was Ando Senti with X-Men 201. And you know, I was off to the races after that. So, yay. But yeah, uh, landing on a Spider-Man book was not, never was never a goal precisely there always seemed to be there always seemed to be spider-man stories lying around um he was really you know as he does now i think he, he was he was carrying the franchise then too so do you, do you see yourself as a bit of a journeyman artist you know you kind of like doing a little bit of this now, a little bit you of gotta that. be you gotta be careful with that term journeyman people people mean that I think you mean, I hope you mean that to me. And here's, here's a guy who goes from place to place and, you know, kind of, you know, the monster man who jumps in where, where he's needed kind of like a, like a firefighter in a way. Um, and that's fine. I'll accept that. Uh, the actual definition of journeyman is somebody who's not, who's only kind of mediocre, not real great. I, I, I don't, I don't mean, I don't mean it that way. Um, I, I, and I, I, I can think of like film directors that you get that as a label in like a ne negative way. I, and, and I'm probably using the wrong word. So I apologize yeah. because I'm no, obviously I, a I big was, fan was, of your work, but I was, I was, as, I was as startled as the next guy to, 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 to read that the definition of journeyman was not what I thought it was at all. It's, it's, yeah. One of those but, but I, I can but, see your interests seem to be like, you know, uh, uh, multifold, which, which I, I think maybe Renaissance uh, is a little bit better than, than Journeyman. Um, well, yeah, I, I know I go. I, huh, I don't know. Uh, the, explana the explanation is, is there's, there's lots of different parts to it. One thing I was doing in the 80s was was uh i was taking a lot of russian actually um i was studying russian language uh, on the side and that was and i was using i was, I was involved in um 
these total immersion programs. So it wasn't like an hour a day or something like that. It was like, yeah, six hours a day and you're not allowed to speak English. So it, it impacted deadlines, but it, I did learn a, a shit ton of Russian, or a lot of Russian um, in a short amount of time, which I then used to, to go over there a couple of times before, uh, you know, before the end of the Soviet Union. I took a couple of long trips through the country just to see what was really going on. Um, and that was, that was a worthwhile expenditure of time, but it didn't endear me necessarily to, to editors at the time. Carl Potts, for example, took a dim view of my, my extracurricular activities. Mm. So. Yeah, but the, too bad the internet wasn't around for you then. Um, um, yeah, that's yeah, true. Although, hmm, hmm, getting emails from Carl Pies, that's, that's, a, <laughs> that sounds terrifying too, but I, was, I, I only mention it, yeah. I only mentioned it because, you know, we, we had Stuart and Catherine Eminent on and those two like told me, well, we live in a cabin and we drive into town to access the internet and scan things off to Marvel and then drive back out so there's no communication and i'm like i always think about that all the time i'm like that kind of sounds like the ideal life in a way yeah, that, to just kind of get away and come in and use the tools when you need them yeah that's that's probably more better, that's probably more better. <laughs> um well you know so M miguel's uh life has kind of extended far beyond your and peter's initial run i mean obviously it would go on to do like 40 or so issues um, but it has now come back at, at, with Peter David, I think surprising a lot of people. Um, you know, uh, if, if I'm not wrong, you've done a few variant covers or maybe they had uh, art lying around. Were, were you ever approached to join the team again for this resurgence? And is that um, something you'd be interested in doing? Yeah, the, 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 the reboot in the present with that. Yeah, um, I did what two variant covers. But I also did issue five. That's um, true. Which involved, did it involve the white costume? I think it was, I think that was a straight up old tra trad costume story. Right. But set in present day. So in a way it, it, it didn't, eh. I mean, the, 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 that future costume works well enough in New York, but it's not the same. Um, and I, and I think probably uh, changing the costume to that white thing with the armor and the cybernetics and all that kind of stuff. I think that's, that, that, that's kind of an admission that the blue or, or black, depending on how you want to put it. <laughs> Let the mystery uh, live. The, 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 yeah, the, that costume belongs to the future and probably should stay there. I think that was, that was their way of admitting it. So, yeah kind of fish out of water i didn't really see the point so was was that uh, uh, you know were you ever approached to do that like more long term or no no i you know marvel uh, marvel uh, for a long time has been uh, one of those it, it's been a company that calls every now and then with a project and the negotiation is always tricky because Marvel doesn't Marvel doesn't adjust page rates. Let's let's just put it out there. You know, yeah, no, we, it's we, fair. All all of us have been working for the same page rates for at least twenty years. I mean, they're just it's nuts. It's just crazy. You know, no one's gotten a raise that means anything. You know, we've never gotten health care. I mean, come on, really. So you wind up, the scenario is you wind up basically dickering over five bucks a page with an editor who's half your age, um, who, who's, in the, who's in the uncomfortable position of taking your, your request back up, you know, the, the, the management ladder to the star chamber, the, you know, the, the people upstairs who make these kind of financial decisions. And then and then coming back down and, you know, regrettably, I can't, I don't, you know, and you're like, oh, God, do I feel badly enough about this editor and his, her predicament to do this story or so I just walk away. 
and uh, mm-hmm. you know anymore i just walk away so um and, you know p- possibly on a similar note what was your reaction to seeing uh miguel o'hara at the end of the spider-verse movie were, and were you consulted on his appearance oh, no, in that, that was like I, I got a heads up email you know you know from an editor actually who said you may not be aware but or was it an editor or was it a lawyer? Either way, it was it was some some functionary at Marvel who, who saw fit to give me a give me the heads up that in fact if I stayed through the end of the credits, there would be a Spider-Man 2099 appearance. So yeah, yeah, I was kind of I was kind of thrilled. That was cool. I mean, Oscar Isaac. I mean, you know, like that that's a I big know. deal. I know, isn't that cool? It is cool. I I, I suspect he's going to have a much bigger role in uh, in, in the future uh, of this franchise. I, I I'm very excited about it. I just want to yeah. see Nueva York done by you know artists uh, on that you know in that particular medium it should should be oh, really yeah. interesting. Yeah. Well, I think it's you know, I think it's it's the future, man. It's well, few, um, and, 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 and the amazing thing is, I mean, if you look at it, the amazing thing is, I mean, this guy starts, Spider-Man starts off as a cartoon character, it starts off as a, as a, as a drawing on a piece of paper. And then, you know, he goes, he goes off to the movies and he becomes, you know, he becomes a guy in a leotard, he becomes, you know, another guy in another leotard, and a guy in a leotard with a lot of CGI, and then even more CGI. And, and then finally, someone says, you know what? Let's make him a cartoon character. And the next thing you know, you got the most popular, you got the most successful Spider-Man movie of all time. It's like, yeah, get out your pencil, you know, do it right. It's absolutely my favorite. I mean, (laughs) you know, it's like watching my dreams just kind of like spring out of my head, you know, onto a screen. And and that was really thrilling. And I haven't even contributed to that lore in any way. I can't imagine what it's like seeing something you drew on a piece of paper one day or over a series of days, suddenly walking and talking and, and doing it like that. I mean, it's got to yeah. feel pretty good in some way. It's a, it's a, it's a huge edifice. You know, we all lay our little bricks, stand back and admire. It's good. Yeah. I think that's a healthy way of looking at it. So, you know, I'm, I want to get to our final question about Spider-Man. It's one I ask everybody that comes on the show, um, no matter like what part they played in, in the Spider-Man mythos. But I'm curious, what does it mean to you personally to have contributed to Spider-Man or the mythos of Spider-Man? Well, you know, it's, it is kind of, kind of sobering at the same time, a very, very kind of warming feeling to, to know that, at least in the minds of some people, um, you know, when they think of when they think of the people that I think are fairly godlike, like John Romita Sr. and Steve Ditko, that you know, that maybe my name sneaks in there too. You know, I was I went to the the, the Society of Illustrators um, because I was told there was something of mine hanging on the wall and. When they they did a Spider Man exhibition, and, and someone someone said, you know, there's some of yours up here. I'm like, what? No. But yeah, they had they had, they you know they felt they felt like they had to include a black costume page, and they happened to have one. So there it was in the Society of Illustrators. I was like, oh, isn't that something? How cool! Ain't that a thing? You know? That's a that's an incredible thing. Uh, yeah. So so. You know, getting to more recent, you know, tell us about your work with Ron Mars and Annie Landing. You're doing this new book called Resolution. Uh, you know, yes. for our listeners who know nothing about this, you know, uh, it's one of the main reasons I'm talking to you today. Tell us a little bit about Resolution. What What is it? It is. It's been described, it's been described as, as a space opera, and I guess it kind of is in the sense of it takes place in space and it's got you know, people doing swashbuckly type things, but I, I think it's actually going to be a little heavier than that. I think it's going to be, and I, and I think the science is going to be, um, going to be a bit more rigorous. I think there's going to be some some real relativity and time dilation, and you know, we're we're not we're not fooling around here with this stuff. 
but yeah, um, uh, Ron's, I think Ron is scratching an, an itch of his and uh, maybe Andy too. I'm not sure which one is, is the lead horse here. I suspect it's Andy, but um, they, they both wanted to go back and, and look at uh, something that had a kind of Green Lantern feel to it. There's a, you know, a, a space cops, you know, galactic police, uh, a core of people who are, you know, who are in some way and shape or form responsible for, you know, keeping things orderly and tidy, um, who, you know, come upon misfortune are, and are, you know, broken up or killed even and, and, you know, go away into their dark corners to hide. And here's, here's one character in particular who's being called out of, you know, exile essentially to once again ride to the, the salvation of the, of the galaxy, if not the universe. So um, the clue to the story, I think, is in the title, you know, resolution. Resolution of what? You know, is the resolution of this old war between these good guys and the bad guy. Yes, but also I think the resolution of, uh, you know, the, the the arcs of these discrete characters and how they resolve their particular personal conflicts and their personal, you know, their their the, the, the thing that led them to the to their to the present and how they're going to resolve that thing that led them to their present circumstance and how they're going to move on to that, move from that into you know whatever future awaits them. Um, so resolution on a lot of different levels. I think is, is what we're talking about here with science and um, cool costumes and effects, lots of effects. Okay. I'm, 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 I'm talking, I'm talking to the, ed, to the, uh, we just got our, our colorist identifies Andrew Dollhouse. And I'm like, dude, you know, flares. I want lots of flares. I want, you know, I want glitter, I want swoopy effects, I want all that stuff. So, um, God knows you can be able to make anything out in the panels, but there's going to be lots of effects. <laughs> great, great. I love the, the yeah. truly Hollywood treatment is, exactly. is, is what we're going for here. So, um, you know, you're doing a crowdfunding uh, venture with this on a new platform called Zoop. Zoop, there it is. Look at that double page. Whoa. Oh, oh, wow. That's incredible. Um, yeah. Tell it. Tell us about this. Uh, this um, crowdfunding campaign that you're doing. You know, if people wanted wow. to jump in, what kind of things can they get out of it? And what what has Zoop been like for you? Well, that's the that's the other interesting aspect of this. It's not. I, I think from the from the point of view of the end user, from the point of view of the of the, the supporter, contributor, whatever you want to call yourself, an investor. I think your experience is not going to be terribly different from the traditional kickstarters and all that sort of stuff i mean you're you're still going to get you know all the all the bells and whistles are there all the usual uh, come ons and upgrades and all that kind of stuff um we're going to get you know you can have you can, you can buy sketches and you know once you went to get these various goals met you can, sketches will be offered original art will be offered uh appearances your face in the comic book. That's going to be a thing. Um, you can get that. All the sorts of things that you're, as I say, that you're used to in a traditional crowdfunding vehicle are there on the website. Um, that shouldn't strike anyone as being unfamiliar. What may be different um, and what Zoop offers is this vertical integration. They're going to, they take care of um, fronting the thing. They take care of publicizing the thing they take care of the campaign they take care of supervising they're going to be supervising the actual production of the comic book. they're doing it now um and they will take care of fulfillment at the back end um so to the extent that in a traditional crowdfunding thing uh fulfillment falls to the creators themselves and their wives and their dogs um, this is actually going to be handled by you know people who are on a payroll who are doing it right. So if if you've had problems with at the fulfillment end of a, of a crowdfunding scheme, you won't this time around because this is being done by you know people whose job it is to get it right. Well, that's really exciting. So you know if someone wanted to back resolution and the work that you're doing with Ron Mars and Andy Lanning, 
how, how would they go about doing that? T tell uh, people at home how they might back you guys. I think the simplest thing is probably just just Google Zoop.com. I don't think it's any more complicated than that. It might be Zoop, Zoop backslash resolution. We'll have you there in, a, in an instant, basically. And I'll put um, a link in the show notes of this episode. So if, if yeah. anybody listening wants to go immediately to it, I, I think it looks really awesome. Not only the work that Rick, you're showing me right now, but the way it's all laid out there and all the uh, rewards, I think it's going to be really yeah. exciting. You guys are doing a hardcover, like full-sized book. Yeah, that's going to be, uh, yeah, I, I, I think I'm very curious to see, you know, what the um, Andy's, like I say, I think Andy was the one who formulated the initial pitch. He's the one that sort of promulgated the Bible. Um, there's been, you know, I've, in designing the character as I've departed from a lot of what he's got in there. I hope he doesn't mind. Uh, but he's also going to be the anchor. So this will be very interesting. It's interesting for me to go back to more or less traditional penciling where I have to consider, uh, you know, what a second set of hands and eyes, you know, and, and another intellect is going to make of the pencil drawings. Um, not used to doing that. I've been, I've been, you know, inking myself for, for a, a good long while now working on my own graphic novel. Ha. Huh. But you want, do you want to tell us about that? Well, it's, it's called blue angel and it's, uh, it's going to be coming out, uh, not crowdfunding It's coming out from the, uh, us Naval Institute press. And it's got, it's basically a military story. Um, and I'm about hundred pages into it, get it done pretty soon, but yeah. <laughs> Hey, a hundred pages say, is not enough. myself on that one, and 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 now switching back to pencils for an inker is is an interesting regearing. Um, I'm finding. So I always have to remind myself that Andy Lanning is not just a writer. You know, he's written some of my favorite space books. Yeah. Uh, you know, but he also is he he's like a triple threat. You know, the guy can draw, ink, write. You know, uh, he's yeah. a talented individual. No, he's a machine. The guy's. You guys got energy to spare kind of, kind of i feel like i feel like walking a dog and the dog is like walking down the street ahead of me oh, wait, <laughs> i'm moving as fast as i can well that's really exciting and i hope everybody yeah. listening goes and checks out resolution on zoop and uh rick thank you so much for uh spending some time with us talking about your career spider-man 2099 and your new book uh it was great having you on Oh, it was my pleasure. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, well, I don't think I'm going to be doing any more Spider Man. So I was going to say, let's do it again, but I guess maybe not. So you never know. Maybe we'll have you on to talk about uh, Miguel in the new movie. Well, I just got a, you know, I just got a, uh, a tweet from a, from a reader in Brazil who's, uh, who's, who's just had a baby boy. His name is Miguel O'Hara Santiago something. But he wanted me to know that he named his child after the character of his favorite comic book. I love that. Isn't that, isn't that something? That's pretty wild. That's yeah. pretty wild. Uh, well, very cool. Thank you again, Rick. It was great having you on. Okay. Well, appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks for listening to my interview with Rick Leonardi. You know, if you find this show entertaining and valuable, it would be a huge help if you could please consider supporting us. Recommend Amazing Spider Talk to a friend and, if you're able, become a member on the Patreon. We can only bring you this content with the support of our Patreon members, and we owe the show's success to every single one of them. And we are constantly making exclusive new content for our members. This week, Patreon members will hear Mark and my review of Amazing Spider-Man number 70. So why not take $3.99, the price of a new comic, and put it towards a month subscription to support the show and start receiving our Patreon content. That way you'll hear our Patreon-exclusive review podcast on every new issue of Amazing Spider-Man the same week it comes out, instead of waiting for them to arrive in our public podcast feed. And if you contribute $10 a month, you'll gain access to exclusive artwork from famous Spider-Man artists commissioned exclusively for our members. Just this week, I mailed out a print of Spider-Man fighting Dr. Octopus as his friends look on, 
drawn by official Marvel artist Federico Vincentini in colors and inks, and it is an awesome looking print. Plus, every episode we release a new episode-specific desktop background created for us by artist Nick Cagnetti for our patrons to enjoy. But we know this is a hard time for everybody, as it is for us too, so we appreciate anyone who supports the show just by listening and sharing. But if you do have the means, please join our Patreon to support the continued existence of our show. Just follow the link in the description, and thank you again to all the members who make this show possible. But it's that time, time for all good things to come to an end, so I wanted to say thank you to you, the listeners and viewers, for tuning into this episode of The Amazing Spider Talk, and a special thank you to Rick Leonardi for joining me to talk about Spider-Man 2099. Please be sure to check out his book Resolution on the new platform Zoop. I'll have a link in the description you can click on where you can check out and pick up his book and help support his future work. This episode was edited by Rick Coase with production support from Andy Myers. Our artwork comes handcrafted by artists Ron Friends, Sal Busema, Ray Sumzer, and Nick Cagnetti. Our theme songs were produced by Ryland Bojack and Spider Madge. Plus, our introduction animation and musical stinger comes from Josh Sutton from the YouTube show Panels to Pixels. So, until the clock strikes midnight and rings in the year 2099, our motto will stay the same. And that motto is, with great podcasts, there must also come the amazing spider talk.